Uh, good afternoon, doctors. Welcome to this webinar. Uh, this webinar is called uh, How I Do It uh, by Pediatric Neurosurgery by the Masters. And uh, Health and You is very happy to carry this webinar How I Do It Pediatric Neurosurgery by Masters. This webinar is conceptualized by Dr. Kaushik Seal and is carried to you by Park Clinic and uh, Pediatric Neurosurgery of India. This is a digital initiative by Health and You, a joint venture with Newly Company Limited Japan. We have a very innovative products uh, for the first time in India. Uh, to fulfill unmet medical needs, uh, amnuride, amitriptyline plus mecobalamin combination in three strengths, 5, 10, and 25 for neuropathic pain, uh, migraine, and tension type of headaches. We have uh, amnuride beta, first time in India, amitriptyline combined with propanolol when one drug is not enough in migraine, uh, amnuride beta 520 ER, amnuride beta 1040 ER. For moderate to severe neuropathic pain, we have amnuride P, amitriptyline plus pregabalin, where pregabalin is given in a sustained release form to match pharmacokinetic profile of amitriptyline once a day. So it is pharmacological for moderate to severe neuropathic pain. We have neuride injection, mecobalamin injection coming in from Japan. This is the only imported injection available from Japan in mecobalamin to give you highest quality in neuropathic pain, in low back pain. We were the first one, the only one to launch 2.5 milligram of clobazam to uh, give added flexibility and added control in epilepsy uh, so that you can up tighten the dose, down tighten the dose, or can give BID doses if required. Add clobaz 2.5, 5, and 10. And recently we have launched first vitamin therapy for migraine Brentamine, riboflavin 200 milligram, magnesium 200 milligram, and CoQ10. Such innovative products uh, with the help of your suggestion and ideas. Looking forward to your suggestions, thoughts to launch many more new products. Now I have pleasure in introducing Dr. K. Santosh Mohan Rao, who is our moderator today. Dr. Santosh Mohan Rao is consultant pediatric neurosurgeon uh, of Rainbow Children's Hospital, Chennai. Uh, sir is uh, also a fellow from Pediatric Neurosurgery, uh, Alderherz Children, NHS Foundation Trust, UK. Sir has uh, published uh, several, uh, several uh, publication research papers. He has contributed to chapters uh, in uh, the textbook uh, written by Professor Ramamurthy and Tandon, uh, textbook of neurosurgery. Sir is also a recipient of uh, Professor C.V. Chari medal. And Sir has been rewarded with Young Achievers Award from Karnataka Sam. Uh, sir, over to you. Uh, please carry this uh, session forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Naik. Uh, it gives me a very great pleasure today to start this webinar. And uh, thank Dr. Kaushik anyway for organizing this. So the topic of today's webinar, how I do it, pediatric neurosurgery by the masters. So we have two topics today. So one is endoscopic third ventriculostomy, very commonly done procedure. And to speak about it, we have uh, Professor Kaushik Seel, who is a consultant neurosurgeon, associate professor of neurosurgery at the Cup Park Clinic, Kolkata, and also the NHRN. And uh, he did this for fellowship at Paris at La Perry in, uh, in Neckers. Then we have uh, Dr. Subodh Raju, he's known in introduction, senior consultant neurosurgeon in Apollo Health City and Rainbow Children's Hospital in Hyderabad, and then Mr. Fall India Institute. He's talking about endoscopic fenestration of arachnoid cysts. And the discussion panel, none of them need any introduction anyway. So we have uh, uh, Dr. N.K. Venkatramna, former president of the NDSPN and uh, chairman and chief neuroscientist at uh, Brain Neurospine Center Hospital, Bangalore. Then uh, we have uh, Dr. R. Murli, senior consultant neurosurgeon at Sri Ramakrishna Hospital, Coimbatore, for, uh, former secretary and currently treasurer of NDSPN. And uh, we have uh, Adya Professor Sandeep Chatterjee, HOD of Neurosurgery, WIMS, and Park Clinic, Kolkata. A mentor to many, especially to me. Uh, he is also the president of the Indian Society of Pediatric Neurosurgery. So we hope it will be fruitful. 
and uh, it's only the it's techniques available everywhere. It's the experience which each of these surgeons give small tips about what difficulties they face because each of them will have a different population sample, uh, a different kind of a practice. Some will have pure pediatrics, some referred by the pediatrician, some walk in patients. So each and some work in pure pediatric hospitals. So each of them will would have tailor made their techniques to the hospitals they work in. And that is what uh, is, 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 the, is the benefit of a webinar like this. What's, what's there is usually in the books, but small problems which they face and solutions which they have tried for. So we not waste any more time without much ado. We start off with uh, Professor Kaushik Sayu, who about his uh, endoscopic third ventricular technique. Over to you, Professor Kaushik. Yeah. Good afternoon, everybody. I'll just take a minute to share my screen. They have lost. Can you see my screen? Nope, not very audible. Not <coughs> we saw it during the trials, isn't it? Was there during the yeah. trials? I was trying to go back to the webinar. Yeah. Can you see now? Yep, can we yes. can. So today I will uh, start the, this webinar having a presentation on endoscopic third ventriculostomy. It is one of the most uh, important uh, uh, and uh, most common procedure that we do in nowadays pediatric and adult practice. One of the most uh, 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 treatments for hydrocephalus, common treatment for hydrocephalus. First, some disclaimer and acknowledgements. Some, I have uh, procured this 4K video that will be shown in this picture because for, for, for outside source for academic demo purpose only. This is not our standard operating video. And the video editing has been assisted by my colleague, Dr. Siddharth Mistry. So endoscopic third ventriculostomy is indicated in non-communicating hydrocephalus due to congenital aqueductal obstructions, posterior third ventricular tumors, posterior fossa tumors, and carry malformations, and also in some cases of post-infective hydrocephalus. So basically, the principle is to, the endoscope uses some rod and a series of lenses to magnify the images and, li and light at the front to lit up the operating area and also to magnify it to a certain extent. And with the endoscope, in the ECV, we do endoscopic visualization of the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle at the first step. That, that is done through an approach to the non-dominant frontal transcortical approach via a pre-coronal bar hole. And then in the second step, by advancement of the endoscope to the third ventricle, to the foramen of Monroe. And next step to, uh, is to fenestrate the floor of the third ventricle so that the CSF of the obstructed third ventricle is communicated with that of the interpendicular system and to be reabsorbed by the arachnoid villi subsequently. Before we proceed to a successful endoscope, we need to, tailor, uh, to select the patient for whom this ETV will be successful. As you all know, nowadays we will follow this ETV success score devised by Kulkarni et al. That is a sum of the age score, the etiology score, and the previous shunt score. And when the ETV success score is, uh, is of a reasonable uh, variety, uh, reasonable amount, then we proceed with the endoscope instead of a shunt, endoscopic third ventriculostomy instead of a shunt. And before we proceed to the ETV actually, we need to have a special attention to the specific anatomical picture of that patient, whether this anatomy actually favors uh, 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 the procedure or not. We need to uh, look, have a serious look at the coronal images and the sagittal images of the MRI and look at the weight of the foramen, the ventricles, the foramen of Monroe and the aqueduct whether the third ventricular floor, floor is bulging or not, the structure of the anterior and posterior recesses of the third ventricle, whether there is a large massa intermedia or not, which can hinder the access to the floor, the position of the basilar artery from the clivus, and distance of the stoma, the third ventricular floor, from the skull, and also the surrounding neurovascular anatomy. This is a pre-operative radiological pic picture. 
showing one of the favorable types of acute acute stenosis, which is a good case for a neuroendoscopy. It is a good practice to take a photograph of these coronal images like this and blow it up with your camera or with your mobile, and you can see the you can see the make out the mammillary bodies. And if there's a good space between the mammillary bodies, that is one of the good anatomical prognostications that uh, ETV will be successful. So this practice in day-to-day -day cases of seeing the images, studying the images pre-operatively in details can lead to less amount of failures or less amount of surprises during the operative steps. And also the common thing is to, to look at the sagittal, mid-sagittal images and look at the space in front of the basilar artery and behind the clitus. Also, the ETV feasibility uh, needs a technical knowledge and a learning craft to which everybody has to learn. Every person doing the ETV must learn the basic of the optics of the scope, the various parts of the particular scope he's using, like the valves, the camera alignment, to adjust the magnification and the focus with minimal hand tremor, the practice of holding the scope steady throughout the procedure without any rocking movement because you can damage the phonics and the surrounding structure. And uh, and the practice of smoothly passing the catheter and the instruments like biopsy forceps to the scope. That requires a steep learning curve, which everybody mm, learns to only by repeated, repeated practice and performance. This is a common armamentarium for an ETV. We require an endoscope with a sheet, a light source, a camera, and a coaxial cable. And some accessories help a lot. One of these use very useful accessories is to use a peel away sheet. A peel away sheet is like a trocker, which, which after the ventricular puncture, we put the peel away sheet inside the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle, and then the endoscope goes through the peel away sheet. In that case, it reduces cortical damage. It reduces endoscopic misplacement. It also allows egress of the saline so that interventricular pressure doesn't build up. And this also uh, 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 helps a uh, guidance so that the endoscope is not being manipulated too much during the procedure. Endoscope holder is also a good, uh, good thing, especially if you are planning to do a biopsy so that the surgeon has a, both his uh, hands free. And also some neuro navigation is an, uh, as I will come later on, is actu actually required for accurate placing of the bar hole and for guidance inside the third ventricle. We can have some optional luxuries as like leisure for biopsy, um, for thick tumor capsule, and a robotic assistance for eliminating hand tremor and fatigue. The first step in doing an endoscopic third ventriculostomy is to check your equipment. It is very common that, I, uh, that uh, you have started the procedure, uh, giving the incision, and then see the endoscope has malfunctioned. So before, before uh, as the dripping and the uh, and, uh, antiseptic dressing is progressing, it is imperative to check the endoscope, especially the illumination, the white balance, the magnification, the orientation, the focus, and whether the fluid is egressing fully. Check the balloon, whether the balloon is inflating properly, and whether there is no leak or not, and the camera, the screen, the connectors, the recording, everything is in proper order. This is the first basic step before starting any procedure with the endoscope, and also to check the height and the temperature of the irrigating fluid. We usually use a ringer lactate, and we usually keep at a height of around 100 centimeters, and with some amount of pressure assistance, so that if required, irrigation can be uh, uh, pumped in quickly. Head position has to be in the strict midline. We usually use a horseshoe head holder, not a pin, unless we use our optical based na na navigation system. In children, we use an electromagnetic navigation system, and therefore the horseshoe head holder is sufficient. And the neck has to be flexed so that the bar hole is superior. This gives a great advantage because the CSF egress, uh, um, the loss of CSF once the ventricle is uh, tapped is minimal. And at the end of the procedure, the air trapped inside the tract can also easily escape out if you play, place the bar hole strategically at the most superior part. So we, we, there is no fixed degree of neck flexion, but for each head, we flex the neck sufficiently so that the bar hole is at the highest point. Skin incision has to be made in a horseshoe shaped flap. 
to make a vertical uh, incision over the bar hole there is a chance of increasing the csf leak a horseshoe shape flap not only uh, help to have a double layer closure but also have a give gives a less chance of having a post operative csf leak which is a common uh, uh, common complication of an endoscopic third ventriculostomy the galial incision is usually placed i place a galial incision slightly anterior to the skin incision and a separate i try to lift a peritoneal layer separately from the galia that gives a double layer uh, always so that uh, it gives an additional protection against the post operative csf leak however in a very thin skull in a very large and thin skull of a neonate it may not be possible neonate means not an infant it may not be possible but in uh, uh, young young children and adults it is always possible to lift a separate peritoneal layer and that gives a good closure at the end the bar hole has to be of sufficient size to accommodate the endoscope and the sheet every endoscope has a measurement and we must ensure that the bar hole is so is not so tight so that the endoscope movement is uh, is hampered it the endoscope must freely move within the durotomy so the bar hole has to be sufficiently large even some people practice a mini craniotomy for and then closure but we use a significant a large amount of bar sorry a significant larger size of bar hole and then uh, adequate durotomy so the endoscope can come in and go out at ease and before putting the endoscope we again recheck the irrigation port especially the outlet port so that out the, the that the, the csf uh, build up the pressure build up inside the ventricle is not much next is the planning of the bar hole size the traditionally we used to place the bar hole side 2.5 cm lateral to the sagittal suture and 1 cm anterior to the coronal suture the ideal trajectory however is a measurement in an each individual uh, patient by taking the mid sagittal um, image of the mri and extrapolating a line from the tuber sinorum to the foramen mangro monro to the surface of the skull just anterior to the coronal suture there is a caveat in this because as you know the coronal suture is not a straight this is sagittal suture which is a straight line but the coronal suture bends for bends forwards as it goes laterally so if you want to place a bar hole a little laterally suppose you are trying also aiming to do a septostomy along with etv then we usually try to place a bar hole a little bit laterally then if you maintain that uh, that uh, idea of having just one centimeter in front of the coronal suture then you will be ending at a wrong trajectory so for as as the bar hole gets laterally it has to be backwards towards the coronal suture remembering always the coronal suture tilts forward so 2.5 cm here and just anterior to that line perpendicular distance from the coronal suture this line is important not the actual coronal suture on the skull so if you go in the wrong track during an etv you can land up very in, in important allocant structure like the correct nucleus the internal capsule and there may be chance of damage to them so it is always better to go act plan the bar hole so that you can hit the ventricle at the, and the moment you can put the endoscope in you can know that you went the right track by seeing the ventricular anatomy occasionally in a very dilated foramen monro you can identify the foramen monro and also you can see the third ventricle initial after just after the initial tap so once however nowadays if we have an image guidance it is always better to plan the entry point and the trajectory trajectory to be selected on a case to case basis with neuro navigation rather than being rather than having a standard measurement of bar hole that is 2.5 to 3 cm lateral and just in front of the coronal suture as you can see in these three images the skull shape are different the frontal horn shape are different so for each individual the exact trajectory to the floor of the third ventricle can be planned with a neuro navigation and a bar hole has to be adequately can be adequately placed if you have neuro navigation next procedure after tapping the ventricle putting the sheet is to put the uh, endoscope into the lateral ventricle once you put the endoscope into the lateral ventricle you get a panoramic view of the lateral ventricle 
and the first thing is to identify the choroid flexus and point the endoscope towards the foramen magnum. You can wait here and have some time to orient the endoscope and also to orient the anatomy. This is of extreme importance. Uh, imp extreme importance. The third ventricle, you can will have, if you en enter the, the lateral ventricle in the right way, you will have septum medially, and laterally you will have the head of the caudate nucleus. The caudal flexors will be at the bottom, leading to the foramen of mangrum, and in front will be the genu of the corpus callosum, and the float will be the rostrum of the corpus callosum. Next, our target will be to put the endoscope to the mouth of the foramen of Monroe. The foramen of Monroe, as you all know, is guided by the choroid flexors and the junction of the septal vein and the thalamocyte striate vein. And it is bounded by the body and the horns of the phonix. Usually, the foramen of Monroe is dilated in a case, all cases of chronic hydrocephalus or even acute hydrocephalus for which ETV is aimed. That is one of the pre considerations before attempting an ETV. You should uh, look, try to look at the width uh, pre operatively, try to gauge at the width of the foramen of Monroe with the pre operative MRI images so that the foramen of Monroe, Monroe is not constricted. Sometimes you can find, especially in redo cases or post shunt cases, the foramen of Monroe is occluded by a thin membrane which needs to be penetrated in order to go down to the third ventricle. Once you pass the endoscope, rigid endoscope to the foramen of Monroe, we can go inside the third ventricle. And once in the third ventricle, the most important structure that comes uh, in view are the two mammillary bodies, two whitish structures. Again, orientation is important before attempting anything. You have to place the endoscope there and look, for, look uh, uh, towards the side to look, to look at the anatomy. The infundibular recess is absolutely in the front, followed by the tubus sinarum, our the, our area for ventriculostomy, followed by the mammillary bodies, and you can see the aqueduct in the behind. And on both sides, anteriorly will be the hypothalamus, and posterior, posteriorly will be the uh, will be the subthalamus. So it is an absolutely eloquent area of the brain. And if you can see in front, you can tell the endoscope in front. You can see some part of the anterior commissure, lamina terminalis, optic recess, and even the optic chiasm also. Next, our endoscope, we need to our plan a target area for endoscopic third ventriculostomy. Usually, it is just in front of the mammillary bodies because the floor of the third ventricle can be divided into a pre-mammillary portion where it is thinnest and then an interpeduncular portion between the mammillary bodies where it is intermediately thick and a peduncular portion where it is quite thick. So this pre-mammillary portion is our target of endoscope and usually uh, for the fenestration is made in the triangle between the infundibular recess and the mammillary bodies. And within this triangle, two things are to be looked for. One it is where is the most transparent site so that you can see the impression of the basilar artery. And number two is to see the pulsation of the basilar artery so that and try to perforate anterior to the basilar artery in order to avoid the brainstem and the perforators. So the initial perforation is guided by the pulsation of the basilar artery and the uh, uh, transparency of the floor. What to do, we, we try to put the endoscope in and to make an impression of the floor of the, uh, sorry, the endoscope, the catheter in, the Pogati catheter, and try to put an impression in the floor of the third ventricle so that the floor becomes a little bit indented and we can see the basilar artery, the pulsation becomes less. The strict midline is, is to be followed because if you deviate to both the sides with the fenestrating instrument, then you can injure the hypothalamus. Whatever we call the floor of the hypothalamus, uh, we are calling the floor or fenestrating the floor, is actually, it is a part of the hypothalamus. It's a tibor sinarum of the hypothalamus. Therefore, it is an eloquent area of the brain, and so the collateral damage has to be minimal. We use a balloon catheter, not uh, not uh, the uh, rigid instrument like see like is shown in this video, to dilate the um, uh, the fenestration after making the hole. In many cases, in sometimes if the floor is thick, we may use the end of the bipolar or the monopolar without a current. Only the blunt end of the bipolar or the endoscopic bipolar or endoscopic monopolar to make a hole, make the initial fenestration, so that a uh, uh, hole is made. And then we can enlarge the fenestration 
one of the uh, reason of uh, one of the risk of plunging in beta bipolar or the monopolar is that there is a risk once a small hole is made you can the bipolar or the monopolar to which you can aim to make the hole a little bit bigger can go plunge in straight down to the basilar artery and the brain stem so absolute hand control is a must at this step next uh, enlargement is can be done with either a forceps like this as shown here you can use scissors but there's a very risky and usually we usually do with the endoscope we put the endoscope in and then and rock the endoscope uh, on sideways on both side so that this enlargement is occur this enlargement the hole is enlarged to an approximately uh, size of around 4 mm a 4 mm stoma if you can achieve is a good serviceable st stoma but this enlargement remember again what you are enlarging you are putting the hypothalamus at stretch so vigorous uh, sideways dilatation can again damage the fibers of the hypothalamus and cause post operative di and other problem next up is post the fogarty uh, catheter we use the number 3 french fogarty catheter put the balloon the whole balloon has to go inside that hole that have been made and then the balloon has to be inflated fully we usually keep the balloon for inflated for a minute or so and then deflate it and if there is no and also also have a look at the heart rate if there is no bradycardia we reperform this step for 3 to 4 times so that the step the here yeah, the stoma is maximally dilated again if you do the dilate it very very if you put the, uh, the balloon very deep and then dilate it there is an uh, chance of injury to the small perforators that are exactly below the the stoma so the balloon has to be snugly fit in the hole not go too deep not very superficial and then stretch the balloon to the maximum capacity a uh, number 2 or number 3 fogarty is enough after this we take the endoscope down to have a entry into the system the weight of the endoscope is sufficient to dilate the system and you can see the basilar artery and the brain stem immediately though it has been covered by a second layer of membrane but is a part of the lilucris membrane again to dilate open the lilucris membrane you have to take a, put the balloon and to do a further dilatation the problem of doing a balloon uh, balloon dilatation of, of the lilucris membrane is that there are hidden perforators just posterior to this um, to this balloon which may which may be beyond your vision and there is a chance of damaging to the to the, to the membrane it requires patience and it will require a lot of time uh, with the endoscope alternately with the endoscope and with the balloon so that you can get a good view the perforators can be as dangerously close to this as shown in this video so you have to be very careful in this step dilating the second membrane many a times if the head is long you may the endoscope may not go in then you have to go in need the balloon only and remember anything that is beyond the line of vision uh, enlarging it blindly that is a risk of damaging the perforators and cause bleeding and sun, sudden bradycardia so after an, a sufficient endoscope uh, uh, stoma is made we have to check the stoma by doing a hydrostatic test we used to uh, we close all the endoscopic outlet ports and stop the irrigating fluids after opening for 10 seconds open the endoscope outlet and you can see the csf coming from the basal cistern to the ventricle the reverse flapping of the floor of the third ventricle that gives an idea probably the csf from the basal cistern are coming to the third ventricle so that the stoma will be kept open even after the mm, the procedure and we can see uh, if the flow is thin we can even see a slight elevation of the fenestrated flow so the endoscope in the next step will need to be gradually withdrawn from the third ventricle into the lateral ventricle where we again need to stop for some time and inspect whether it has been damaged especially while doing work inside the third ventricle the rigid endoscope will be hinged on the fornix and there is a chance of damage to the fornix and both to the body and to the two horns of the fornix there may be chance of damaging to the small blood vessels that accompanies the choroidal plexus that is the branches of the medial posterior choroidal arteries and the small choroidal veins so hemostasis will be required at this step after seeing the third, third ventriculostomy if you are not aiming for a septostomy then the endoscope can be withdrawn gradually and 
the endoscope uh, withdraw after endoscopy is withdrawn the peel away sheet is kept for a little time again to look towards the bleeding and also to irrigate the ventricles fill up with fluids and then gradually gradually the peel up uh, peel away sheet is gradually pulled up and the tract we usually plug with a gel form which minimizes csf leak in our setting we try to do a dural suture if possible otherwise we reinforce with a fibrin glue and as i've told previously we do a two layer closure with a peritoneum and the skin and post operative we keep nursing in a head up position for 48 hours and sometimes if you are not satisfied with the stoma we give some amount of anti edema measures for first 48 hours so etb has a steep learning curve we need to do a high volume of cases so as to develop the skill is never an end to this learning and etb is one of those things in various indications as shantosh has told previously you have to practice practice and practice and build up your skin uh, you build up your skill and you have to be very selective in choosing patients the right patient the right indication and the right anatomy with mri is the key to the success and always we have to have a plan b in case of a pel procedure whether to put an evd whether to do a shunt in the same sitting whether to go back and put in a reservoir and close follow up in the required for an early dystenosis an early dystenosis may occur within one month in a significant number of patients and before discharge we need to do an an uh, uh, mri a cnf flow mri to see whether the csf is the stoma is kept open or the csf is flowing to the stoma thank you thank you doctor uh, Thank you, Dr. Kaushik, for the presentation. And I will leave to the discussion panel to our panelists if they have anything to add. Venkat, you want to um, ask your questions first or your comments? Yeah. Uh, very nice presentation, uh, Dr. Toshik. It's a uh, uh, very nice depiction of the technique. Uh, and one thing is uh, very important is that I think for the beginners, I think you need you need to be very careful in dealing with the uh, ETV. Always, if you are in doubt of the anatomy, I think best is to come back till you become confident. I mean, there are many techniques that we can adapt as you become an uh, uh, expert. In doing that, after doing many ETVs, even when there is the ventricle is small, foramen mandra is small, and uh, floor is thick, and if there is no space uh, between the mammillary bodies and the dorsum, so many many techniques are known. But as an educational session, I think this is the wonderful thing that you need to know the basic straight technique, and then whenever you are in doubt, I think best is to come out. Especially when you are dealing with uh, very young children <clears throat> or children with myeloma meningocele, sometimes this anatomy can be and corpus callosum can be defective, and we may not be very clear about the foramen of Munro and the floor of the third ventricle. Uh, there is no ego issue in this situation. Best is to come out. Now another important uh, step is that as soon as you go to the lateral ventricle, you try to assess the size of the foramen of Munro. And that is where you need to decide if the foramen of Munro is smaller, then uh, try to use the smaller scope so that you don't damage the phonics. So you can use the uh, mini lota or a smaller uh, scope. So that's the most important thing. And uh, uh, one important thing is not to coagulate the, uh, use the diathermy on the floor. That's very, very important step. Uh, the second thing is now, if the you are not very clear about the location you need to puncture, go more towards the dorsum, not towards the mammillary bodies, so that you are safe. You can touch the bone, and then from there you can take the uh, steps further. Now, uh, when you are trying to introduce an uh, uh, instrument and then never try to rotate uh, more than 90 degrees, you know when you try to twist, as uh, Dr. Kaushik has demonstrated beautifully, perforators. Uh, they can get pulled out, you know, on the other side, which are very close to the membrane of the leg paste. So you should, your movement cannot go beyond a particular range and you can come back again. So that's the very important thing. And that the forceps is very useful. You have 
a very good control in putting the forceps and gently putting it outside. The only caution is when you're trying to take over the forceps, you make sure it's fully closed and no tissues in between the blades of the forceps. Otherwise, you tend to pull the floor itself. That's the, one of the common mistakes that happen. So I think that's the, uh, the common questions. Of course, there are many other techniques which have been described. Go to the dorsum cella and then uh, make a perforation and then come down if there is the floor is very uh, narrow. And uh, the second thing is some people use the bevel of the scope itself so that the vessel artery is protected. And with the scope itself, we perforate that. But of course, these are the, not the routine techniques. These are the techniques which are used for the uh, special situations by the people who got enough experience and hang of it. So I think it's a, a wonderful uh, uh, depiction of all the technique by Dr. Kaushik. Would anyone like to add, Professor Sandeep, regarding yeah. the choice of uh, endoscope or something? I think Murli wants to say something. Yeah. Oh yeah, please. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, oh, go. Kaushik, excellent uh, presentation. Uh, congratulations. Uh, only thing is uh, whether you could have said a, a few words about what would happen if there is a bleed especially for those who are just starting off. Uh, if they have a bleed, then the main point is not to panic and pull out the scope. Uh, you have to keep irrigating and uh, till you find that the bleed, and it may take some time, you need to have patience and uh, make sure that your uh, irrigation is sufficient enough. And eventually, if it is a small bleeder, it will stop. So you have to be patient and uh, uh, keep irrigating till that is over. Uh, Again, the most important thing is when you want to puncture the floor and you're not able to see the anatomy well, or if it is opaque, if it's completely opaque and you can't even see the basilar artery or any of the structures beyond that, then as Dr. Venkat suggested, it is better to uh, call it a day and, and come out rather than try puncturing it blindly and then having a catastrophe. Uh, again, uh, for the... Uh, for the youngsters, if you, uh, it is better to avoid putting in the, the forceps as the first thing, unless you're very sure of your thing. As Venkat said, you can catch a, either a small perforator or a, or a vessel. And then if you start pulling it, that is the danger point. So for those who are starting, it is better to start off by puncturing with the uh, Fogarty catheter and use the Fogarty catheter first. And then as you get more confidence, perhaps you can introduce that. And scissors, of course, is to be avoided as far as possible and uh, not to do it. Uh, so thank you for a nice uh, presentation. That's what I have. Would anyone like to add anything about the type of scope, the, the PD scope and the way Andy Pro I was going to add something about the type of catheter rather than the type of scope. But I think the type of scope is really a matter of personal choice and availability. And ultimately, um, apart from the diameter, as Venkat pointed out, all scopes are the same. Uh, the point that I was going to make, and this is uh, since um, some beginners will be seeing this, a very important thing to realize about the Fogarty catheter is that the balloon is actually quite a bit proximal to the tip of the catheter. So when you need to dilate the stoma with the balloon, you actually have the tip a significant distance below the stoma. And that's really the, the unpleasant thing about the Fogarty catheter, because if you have perforators there or you have adhesions there, then that tip uh, has a possibility of causing an injury. And this is something to be aware of, because most people think that the the balloon is at the tip. The balloon is not at the tip in a Fogarty catheter. In fact, as you know, there are now uh, specially designed catheters. Um, I won't mention the name of any company, but they're called neurocatheters, which have the balloon at the tip. And I'm really looking for, um, for a nice catheter designed in this country, which will have the, uh, the balloon at the tip so that you don't have to you know, dry, particularly if you're doing a small little baby, you don't have to put that tip so far deep to the stoma to be able to get that balloon to dilate the stoma. So I think that's an important thing and that is worth realizing that you're actually putting the tip beyond and, and particularly when you're dilating the balloon, you're not seeing the tip, don't forget that. And, and, and I think that's a, a potential for a problem and one should be aware of that when you're using a Fogarty catheter which we, most of us do because very few of us have access to this neurocatheter, which has a balloon at the tip, which of course was designed from Necker, 
and they're now used extensively in Europe and parts of North America. But I don't know what, what the rest of the panelists feel about this, but I think that's the biggest disadvantage of the Fogarty catalyst. Maybe uh, I, I, to make a comment. I totally agree. I totally agree, Sandeep. Yeah, uh, this is most important when you are doing the second membrane because that is even deeper than the original floor. Absolutely. So you have if you put a lilac membrane there and you, you're trying to dilate that with a um, Fogarty catheter, then the tip is perilously close to the basilar artery or its perforator sometimes. Yeah, absolutely. And the tip will need not be in straight line all the time. You know, yeah. once it goes inside, it can curve. So that's the most yes. dangerous aspect yes. part of it. Yeah, other uh, important you things are, uh, you know, uh, you need to be very careful about the amount of fluid you are irrigating, the temperature of the fluid, yeah. and the constitution of the fluid. Nowadays, people use with the... Yeah, so what type of fluid do you always use? I think it's some problem with radio. I think Subodh was asked, was wanting to yeah. ask a so two, two points. I was fortunate to use this uh, balloon catheter. Uh, I had around 10 way back in 2007 when it was initially introduced. It was good, but now uh, they don't have an approval to sell in India. That's a problem. That company is not uh, getting it in India. Right. So initial part of the days, uh, we used those uh, catheters. But actually what Dr. Sandeep told us, it's very useful. But let us see. Uh, under the new Atman Nirbhar program, SM Indian will design it, we will design it and uh, have that type of... Uh, now, my catheters. purpose of saying that, Shubhot, was I was hoping that you would be one of the young people who would design a catheter like that with a balloon at the tip. You'll get it. You'll get it. We got Dr. Venkatram from the back. I think Sir was asking. Yeah. Sorry, wanted to add something. Yeah. No, no. I, I was talking about the ringer lactate. We add soda bicarb yeah. to bring it to the... Uh, physiological stage of components into the this one. Most important thing is to watch the irrigation outlet. As the, sometimes, you know, you keep uh, irrigating and if the outlet is not open fully, sometimes there can be sudden increase in the intracranial pressure. I think that is something which we need to be uh, keeping in mind all the time, particularly when there is some bleeding. You know, when the out of anxiety, you try to irrigate faster to make the field clear and you need to be absolutely alert to see that the fluid is draining out uh, from the ventricles. Otherwise, you will have, I mean, field is clear, but you'll have much more problems because of a sudden increase in the uh, Other point I wanted to mention was whenever you are dilating uh, the ventriculostomy floor with a Fogarty catheter, yeah. uh, you should not be in a hurry to uh, pull out the Fogarty catheter. Even after you have deflated it also, you have to be very slow in removing the catheter. So that if there is a bleeding, you can immediately re-inflate it in that position. So we should not be in a hurry to uh, remove the Fogarty catheter once we deflate the balloon or when we are dilating it. It has to be very slow. Deflate it in that position. If there is no bleeding, then only uh, try to pull it out. Yeah, the, other, the other important learning point of an ETV or any endoscopic procedure, but definitely ETV, which is what most of us started endoscopic procedures with, is the concept of understanding about the endoscopic blind spot. Which means, for example, you're seeing the stoma, and as Koshik said, this is a, this is a technique I use quite often, uh, and, um, and maybe Koshik has appreciated that, and that's why he uses it, which is I put the, cap, the, the, the scope through the stoma, I actually visualize the basilar artery and the perfect. And I like to rock that scope from side to side as a method of dilating the stoma. Uh, particularly in cases when um, there is uh, something, a uh, vessel or a perforator, where I find if I put the balloon in, the tip is going to touch that. Then I use the scope and use the tip to rock it. But the important thing is, when you're looking at the stoma, don't forget that the stem of your endoscope may be against the fornix. And when you're rocking it or moving it, that's an endoscopic blind spot that people need to be aware of. So when I first started doing endoscopic third ventriculostomies and I went and spent some time with Professor Pranexti in, in Mainz, 
The first thing he said is after every ATV, we draw your scope and count how many bruises you've caused on the fornix or in the intraventricular foramen. And the day you take it out and find there's no bruises there, you're doing the operation the right way. So I think it's very important to be aware that there is a blind spot and you're hitting lots of other things with the proximal part of the scope that you're not seeing. This is particularly true when people are trying to do an endoscopic third ventriculostomy and combine it say with a biopsy of a pineal region tumor or something like that, you can see beautifully rocking your endoscope back, but you don't realize that you're actually pushing that endoscope against very important structures at the foramen of Monroe as well. And I think that's an important uh, thing I've learned the hard way. One of the, one of the important ways to avoid this complication is make the bulb hole slightly bigger. So do you have little range of movement with the hand if the bird hole is narrow and the scope direction is tight, and then when you rock, and there will be a lot of problem. You have little flexibility, the brain itself, the elasticity of the brain, it will move it away so that you move the scope uh, very gently, then you don't cause any damage even the blind spot. One, Just for one way to avoid uh, the problem, or at least to minimize it, is to withdraw the scope into the uh, from the third ventricle into the lateral ventricle and then you change your instrument. That way you will have the tip of your instrument visible to you in that blind spot uh, before you insert it back into the third ventricle. Then you know exactly where your uh, forceps or your balloon is uh, and then you insert it back into the third ventricle. That is one way to avoid injury to the fornix. I don't know whether any of you have seen Professor Panexky doing an ETV when he was first starting it, and I'm going back uh, many, many moons ago when I spent time with him. He had a very interesting concept because of this. He would go in with the scope, see the floor of the third ventricle, and when he put his Fogarty catheter in, he would withdraw the scope and keep it proximal to the intraventricular foramen. He would say, I like to keep the scope proximal to the interventricular foramen and then make the ETV. Now, that's easy perhaps in adults, not so easy in children. But this is what he, he would do first. He would withdraw the scope, bring it just at the foramen or a little proximal, and then put, uh, then make the, um, the dilatation with the balloon. I think like, last, the reason for that was the scope size was much uh, thicker those days. I also... Saw that course, because that. those old Esculap uh, scopes that old Esculap was. With. Now the scopes have become much uh, thinner. I find the most difficult part is to do the first fenestration. Go to the third ventricle port and making the first impression and the first fenestration is the most difficult part. Many times you're not yeah. sure whether it is working or not. You have to poke with the uh, uh, bipolar forceps or the catheter. And making the first one millimeter fenestration is the most difficult part that I usually find. It requires some time. I just wanted to ask the panelists: mm. Has anyone had a problem putting the scope in the first place, the troca? So, just wanted to share a case. We had a seven-year-old boy. You know, he came with the sudden onset, you know, the loss of walking and all that. And uh, so, the scan showed hydrocephalus, but surprisingly, the cortex was also a little bit atrophy. So we, okay, we presumed it's long, we had a large head, of course, we presumed it's long standing hydrocephalus. And so we started with an ETV. The troca just wouldn't go in, no matter what. So then we avoid prudence demanded we avoid any heroics. So we abandoned the procedure and then we put in a shunt later. He, he was later found to have uh, propionic aciduria, which comes in adolescence around the time. And it comes as, as it presents the same way as a long standing ICP. The same thing was found in another patient of ours who had leukodystrophy. So we just couldn't get the trocar in. The brain just, like, it's like, like an amoeboid. It just took the shape of the trocar. It gave way, but we just refused to go into the internet. So in these cases, we finally had to use the bipolar and we proceeded with shunting later. So I don't know whether anyone of you has come, couldn't find any. So Sandeep, whether you found any analysis in your experience, or from that? No, I, haven't, I have not had this problem. So it's, it's, we see it only in adults because they present like that. It's, early, it's okay if it's an infant. The diagnosis is only made. But this happens during the puberty, but there is a certain set of uh, branching as acidurias which come, which present around that. And the history is maybe one or two years. And then we're all days of missed hydrocephalus and we proceed. But this is the problem we have faced in two cases. So, but uh, they are, of course, they may be just uh, red herring, but we couldn't put in the, the troca at all. And uh, it was an experienced hand which we were just trying. So, so that's, that's it. So, so, I know they, I couldn't find any literature regarding that. So, uh, it's interesting. I haven't seen one. 
Yeah, I have to say I don't like that broker. We don't use the broker at all. So we couldn't get brain needle in either. So finally, we so, so. Are there any questions? Any further questioning or anything to be added? I, no. I think in, hmm. we have lost Dr. Sorry, Chatterjee's audio. One yeah. question from one of the audience. I don't know whether you want to answer that question, but it's a very interesting question. It says, uh, does doing full-time dedicated pediatric neurosurgery have a future in India? In COVID times, the future itself is, uh, <laughs> we don't know how many of us will be around in December. <laughs> Maybe after the week we'll talk. Maybe we'll answer that question at the end of the second talk. Uh, another question is that whether you leave a ventriculostomy or not at the end of the procedure. Yeah, what's your, what's your uh, opinion about uh, leaving a ventricular access device or a sort of catheter after doing an ETV? Venkat? For a few days. Yeah, I used to do that earlier. Nowadays, I stopped doing that for the simple reason it increases the chances of uh, subdural collections. So, uh, uh, I have seen that in the literature as well as I have, you know, my own experience. Consecutive cases, the, the subdurals are, incidence is much higher when you leave a ventricular access device. Rather, if you can seal the uh, corticotomy well with gel foam and uh, uh, to seal. I mean, that acts and the failure rate of ETV also will come down because it builds the interventricular pressure enough to keep the uh, patency of the ETV. That's what I feel. Any of the, any of the other uh, experts use a ventricular access device? I think Shubodh has some uh, opinion about this. Yeah, uh, I used to use it initially whenever I would used to find the opening pressure very high or the child uh, has come with an acute symptom. Uh, second uh, instance is a post-infective hydrocephalus I used to leave uh, assist device. Third is where in cases of uh, medulloblastoma where I used to do a, a third ventriculostomy, there also I used to leave a, a ventricular access device. There are three indications where I, uh, the last two indications I still do post-infective and uh, uh, medulloblastomas and these things. I, if I am doing a third ventriculostomy, I leave a ventricular access device. Probably the only place where I keep ventricular access devices if I am not happy with the, uh, with the stoma site. Stoma site. That is the only time I use that. That's also post infected. That's right. Yes. What about uh, doing a lumbar puncture post ETV? What What do you feel about that? Yeah, no, I've never done that. There has been some literature, yeah. some literature has showing There's that. a lot of literature out of Europe saying that, yes. um, particularly in, from Paris initially, saying yeah. that post TTV doing a lumbar puncture for the first two or three days increases the patency of the of the stoma. Anybody um, has any opinion on this? I have never. Come I with say, my personal feeling about this is that exactly as Venkat said. I think if you seal the hole by either whatever, you put gel foam like Koshik showed or you tissue glue, if you seal the hole, then you end up building up an intraventricular pressure. Fundamentally, the opening of the stoma depends on the pressure gradient that you maintain across the stoma, particularly for the initial period. And Suhas has just had a beautiful publication showing the maximum closures occur in the first two weeks. Yeah. Uh, so if you can maintain the first few days a pressure gradient across the stoma, then that works. And now one of the ways of maintaining a pressure gradient is to increase the pressure proximal to the stoma by doing, as Venkat said, you, you seal, you use tissue glue, you seal the cortical opening, you build up enough pressure. The other way you can increase the pressure gradient is by doing a lumbar puncture and reducing the pressure distal to the stoma. So I, I think this lumbar puncture does exactly what you would do by uh, putting in tissue glue and sealing the corticotomy because fundamentally both are methods of trying to increase the gradient across the opening and then there was one time that we were trying to measure the pressures across to see uh, but unfortunately we never got to publishing that i think everyone would agree that uh how, how to do an etv the equally important question is when to do an ETV. 
but that would mean another day because uh, or when not santosh oh yeah rather yeah so everything is a learning how to do and how not to do perhaps so is there anything else to be added then shall we go to the next topic so, yeah thank you dr kaushik for this wonderful presentation and now we move to dr subodh raju for his uh, endoscopic fenestration of arachnoidosis over to you dr subodh Uh, Kaushik, you have to put your put off your screen sharing. Yeah. yeah. Am I visible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, good evening. Thanks, Kaushik and uh, Sandeep for uh, organizing this. Uh, the next uh, best indication after third ventriculostomy of endoscope is uh, arachnoid cyst and uh, as we all know there are uh, numerous locations of arachnoid cyst and different types of cysts are uh, present and different locations of the cysts are there so, so these are the, the they can present various ways Uh, starting from macrocephaly to raised icp to behavioral changes seizures and uh, because there are focal uh, arachnoid cysts uh, in lobes they can present with seizures and everything and the most important thing they can be asymptomatic also so the surgical approach depends on the location of the cyst in its uh, normal anatomical vicinities and therefore its genesis is essential the structure wall of arachnoid cyst that distinguishes it from normal arachnoid membrane is the splitting of the arachnoid membrane at the margin the thick layer of collagen in the cyst wall and absence of traversing trabecular processes and presence of hyperplastic arachnoid cells in the cyst wall that's all they are known to grow so uh, all other location arachnoid cyst fairly everyone is uh, sure what to do or not to not to do but the sylvan fissure in the middle cranial fossa arachnoid cyst is where the uh, still the doubt remains or the controversy remains uh, what to do and two third of this pediatric arachnoid cyst look is located in this uh, location actually and uh, they tell that left side is more affected and my experience also is the same and they can present with headache seizures developmental delay or macrocranial there's a focal temporal bulge in uh, some children which we see actually subdural hematoma and hygroma because sometimes a minor trauma in the case of arachnoid cyst can reach to a, a rupture of arachnoid cyst and they can present as a subdural hematoma or hygroma so are arachnoid cyst is responsible for the presenting symptoms yes they are responsible if they are large if they are causing focal pressure and uh, then which are the arachnoid cysts which require surgical inter uh, intervention many of the asymptomatic cysts can just be followed clinically radiologically and uh, neuropsychiatric evaluation and uh, others can be uh, subjected to uh, different uh, surgical procedures and what is the rationale for treating them csf dynamics can result in increase in size of these cyst and this leads to pers uh, the persistence of mass effect uh, which usually hinders the normal uh, brain development and the younger the patients they are more prone for uh, cyst enlargement so you have to be under constant follow up uh monitoring the cyst uh, clinically and sometimes radiologically also so what is the aim of the surgical treatment we basically is to eliminate the mass effect if there is any and to the adjacent structures and the obstructive effects on the normal cerebral uh, csf pathways and majority of the arachnoid cysts do not resolve completely the reason is because these are all developmental cysts and there is a agenesis on that part of the lobe so even after the cyst is completely resolved you may still see that uh, the uh, area remains as a, a, a empty space actually the csf will uh, cavity though the pressure effect is gone off uh what are the advantages of fenestration because conventionally many of this cyst uh, is uh, uh, shunt was done but uh, uh, it can leave the patient shunt independent and the other thing is it allows the direct inspection and we can do an excision of the portion of the cyst wall and we can do a biopsy and if there is some uh, fragile membrane or uh, fragile blood vessels crossing we can coagulate it because sometimes the cyst wall collapse there can be an hemorrhage also if there is a rapid decompression because there will be thin bridging uh, vessels we can see 
the conventional lead after the shunt different in the for especially for the middle cranial fossa uh, cyst or other places the microsurgical procedures were adopted to uh, they were uh, basically marsupialization or excision of the outer wall they do biopsy of the cyst wall and in cases where the arachnoid cyst has presented with seizures uh, in uh, epilepsy surgery is also performed in these cases surgical approaches for sylvan uh, as i told you could be cystoperitoneal shunt and uh, the dura is often thinned out in these cases and uh, cyst is opened and csf is drained very slowly to avoid the sudden brain shift it happens the aim of this uh, microsurgical procedure is to uh, open the cyst wall and to communicate it into one of the normal csf pathways it could be a ventricular pathway or it could be a subarachnoid uh, pathway uh, there are different uh, publications on this uh, of these patients uh, this is a 8 year child presenting with uh, Headache. If you can see, there's a large uh, symbian uh, middle cranial fossa arachnoid cyst. This was uh, operated by microsurgical method way back actually, uh, marsupialization and communicating under direct microscope actually. And uh, then slowly, as we developed over a period of time, uh, endoscope came in, and uh, this microsurgery uh, things got substituted by endoscopy. So it could be endoscopic neurosurgery or it could be endoscopic assistance. and cysts in the ventricle supracellular region posterior fossa cysts sylvian cyst every all of these cysts became good indications uh, for doing an endoscopic surgery actually uh, there are different publications on this where they have done this uh, communicated the cyst uh, into the uh, subarachnoid space causing this and the most important thing we should remember that uh, we are avoiding a shunt in these cases and with a small bur hole we can uh, Uh, do these procedures an inspection along with a small bur hole we are also able to do an inspection of the complete cavity shunting shunting was described as a standard of care for less than one year but now sufficient literature is available telling that even in the pediatric patient also endoscopy is a very good option you don't have to go for a shunt there's no age limit of this we have a uh, good experience and we have some published of uh, publication regarding uh, arachnoid cyst of across every location we have published in the uh, journal of neurosurgery uh, part a european journal actually and uh, what where the, there's a controversy regarding shunting come in there are few reports that the shunt is better but uh, uh, the shunt complications are same with the hydrocephalus also so shunt is uh, always used as a salvage procedure when all other procedures have failed we do go in for a shunt and uh, the basic principle of endoscopy is same uh, as a microsurgery two things we have to uh, remember in these cases where is the site of the cyst where we have to enter and we are we have to communicate it to these are two important points a principles of doing a, a endoscopy for arachnoid cyst actually like this child presented with a uh, uh, it's a arachnoid cyst presenting with an infantile spasm actually so this Oh. so what you have to do is basically uh, the approach we used is we went through this uh, uh, the parietal uh, bur hole went into the cyst first and communicated the cyst into the ventricle here the cyst is being uh, uh, opened up and then it is communicated into the ventricle that's all uh, this child did well uh, for quite some time actually and then had again had a recurrence uh, of this uh, not the cyst actually is is the infantile spasm didn't uh, subside initial 2 years it, the child did well actually and this is the pre operative and this is the post operative images actually uh for uh, transcortical approach we can do um yeah this is another child with 7 year old child presenting with severe headache and papilledema what we see is that the, the child has a history of trivial trauma and there is a some amount of subdural whether it's a subdural hygroma or it's an a continuation of arachnoid cyst we don't know but there is some communication here we uh, we presume that actually uh, this is but the child had a, was severely symptomatic uh, in this child uh, we did a navigation guided uh, uh, this is uh, opening up of the sylvian fissure first once we have entered into the uh, cyst Uh, we are trying to open it into the the cyst, communicate it into the sylvian fissure first. 
Uh, you can see the branches of the middle cerebral artery. So the two ways of communicating it, uh, once it is in it, then we go to the medial part. Here we can see it into the supracellular system where we want to, that's the main area where we want to communicate it. Uh, we did a cysto cysternostomy in this case. It was opened into the basal system. Uh, the navigation is just required uh, for the initial part, but after that, it's uh, based all uh, based on anatomical landmarks. Uh, after you do a uh, puncture, uh, then we dilate it with uh, four French Fogarty is better because three French Fogarty's site is soft. Four French has a more rigid for opening up these things. You can see the branches of the internal uh, IC, I presume. So we, we, we made multiple uh, openings into this. And uh, once you uh, were sure that there is nothing below, we used even a scissor to cut it open. Just to cut it open slowly and communicate it, multiple openings we made and then we uh, opened it up. So this is a, uh, a middle fossa arachnoid cyst. So basically we, are, we were studying this MRI to know the where to open this actually. These are the locations where we can open it actually. So it's very thinned out and we can go into this thing. There's another case of 12 year old female presenting with scissors. We just did an endo same way. Endoscopic fenestration was done and an opening was created and the child did well actually in these cases. Uh, numerous publications on endoscopic approach for middle cranial fossa is uh, uh, plentifully available. And uh, each of these procedures, everyone is aware of uh, shunting, ventricular shunting, microsurgical excision, endoscopic fenestration, mascularization, the advantage and disadvantage of uh, each of these things. And uh, the only thing is uh, the uh, requires a, uh, the uh, arachnoid cyst, when you go into this middle cranial fossa or a supracellular, it requires slightly more training than a routine uh, third ventriculostomy, especially when these cysts are located in different other locations, actually. So these are cases of classical supracellular arachnoid cyst, uh, which uh, we do endoscopic ventricular, uh, cystoventriculostomy and cystocystonostomy actually. They're presenting with bobblehead syndrome. Similar type of, okay, this is slightly away. A Rathke cyst also was done in the same way actually. Uh, communicated uh, with the cisterns actually. Yeah, the interesting part is these type of cysts actually. So you have to have a slight idea on these things. Uh, so where should you have the entry point? Whether you enter through the ventricle or should you enter through the cyst? Because if you enter through a cyst, sometimes the disadvantage is there's a high chance of CSF leak because there's no parenchyma there. So your dural closure has to be very good. So it depends on your comfort. If you're happy to go into the ventricle and communicate, the cyst is fine. Or sometimes you just go into the cyst and communicate into the ventricle. Knowing the wall of the ventricle, if, if even if you don't have a navigation, it's fine. By the flapping technique, you can know where the wall is. Basically, you rapidly uh, release the CSF. Uh, uh, fluid is uh, left out and uh, let in uh, rapidly. So there is a basically a flapping of the uh, wall of the uh, cyst where you can know where, which is the free wall and after that which you communicate it with that. That takes care of that actually. There are different locations of the uh, large arachnoid cyst actually. You can see here into projecting into the ventricle, the choroid plexus, the foramen of Monroe. Uh, so, uh, so, Cystoventriculostomy is sufficient in many of these cases. These are the posterior fossa arachnoid cyst. Uh, slightly gray, uh, difficult areas when they're away from the ventricle, you have to put a shunt or you do a marsupialization because again, the fear is of CSF leak and pseudomeningocele. There's again a CP angle, uh, large arachnoid cyst communicated into the cisterns. Uh, this is a quadrigeminal uh, cyst, arachnoid cyst. Simple, you do endoscopic cystoventriculostomy, the cyst has disappeared and the cyst is completely collapsed. It's just a simple, uh, the way, same way as you go a third ventriculostomy, a pre-coronal bar hole and do a frontal this thing and uh, just puncture the cyst and communicate it in the ventricle. Uh, if required, if you get a space, you can uh, pass a, a, do a third ventriculostomy along with it because if you see the brainstem has been pushed anteriorly because of this cyst actually. Uh, for the next, these are all uh, supratentorial cysts. The difficult, challenging part is the posterior fossa arachnoid cyst, which we have. 
the two clear cut ma margins are the cysts located around the fourth ventricle or they are away from the fourth ventricle if they are around the fourth ventricle you can happily do uh, or they are bulging into the fourth ventricle you can happily do a transaqueductal procedure because this is a type of a fourth ventricle outlet obstruction so when the uh, there is a fourth ventricle outlet obstruction the aqueducts are usually large so there is a natural pathway available even if you don't have a flexible endoscope doesn't matter you can plan your trajectory of your rigid rigid endoscope here to go around 4 to 5 cm anterior to the canal fissure and you can go uh, directly into, land up into the video cut thing i'll see something else Uh, so you can use a rigid cap scope or a flexible scope for doing this. We go transaqueductally and do a maspellation of the cyst at multiple uh, fenestration. We can do uh, till we see the choroid flexes and the cyst is completely collapsed. Actually, so the same way this this is the aqueduct going into this. You can see the cyst is bulging into the fourth ventricle. See so the cyst is bulging into the fourth ventricle. So initially. thought to be difficult but it is a beautiful indication for doing an endoscopy as i told you you don't need not have a, a flexible if you have a flexible it's well and good but if you have a rigid scope also it's well and good because the cyst is bulging you can maspellize the cyst and just do a third ventriculostomy if required keep on coagulating it and making there is a flexible bipolar available a monopolar available to which you can uh, keep on for uh, very flexible one multiple openings and uh, coagulated so once you start doing these things uh, so you can uh, always expand your indication so once we the next what we did was we went beyond a cyst which is uh, bulging into the fourth ventricle what about a large subset of cases where there is a large retrocerebellar cyst you can do a straight away shunt or do a maspellation but my ex personal experience with this was not good because we had numerous instances of pseudo meningocele and csf leak and all shunt related complications because the shunt is placed acutely in the neck when you put a, a shunt so uh, i thought that going a uh, uh, trans aqueductal because aqueduct fourth ventricle outlet obstruction going through the aqueduct and if we are going into the fourth ventricle then why not we cross the foramen of magendi so this is the foramen of magendi uh, which you are trying to cross and uh, we pass a two french fogarty catheter to dilate the foramen of uh, magendi here and once we dilate the foramen of uh, magendi you can pass the uh, flexible uh, scope into that i just drop it one minute i'll just take it into the presentation mode in forward it so once you are into the foramen of magendi you can uh, pass the flexible scope and you can see the cyst here the complete cyst and everything so this becomes i mean as uh, as we do more and more we know that uh the indications uh, depending on your comfort level the indications become more slightly you have to be careful in the initial phases but it's okay and uh, the assist wall actually we can uh, fenestrate it number of places this is occipital bone we have gone into the cyst this is the cyst is completely maspellized you can see number of uh, places fenestration is done along with that a third ventriculostomy is also uh, also done in these cases the child developed some amount of subdural hygroma but that settled down this is another case uh, where this uh, third ventriculostomy could not be done because the uh, child had a, a very very uh, narrow prepontine system so after doing a, a similar case of retrovesicular cyst so after doing this fenestration 
uh, and uh, manipulation of the cyst actually what we did was we placed a catheter inside that into the fourth ventricle to the fourth uh, uh, aqueduct uh, we go and uh, place the catheter inside it you can see we are guiding the catheter the catheter is outside the scope the scope the flexible scope is just guiding it uh, through the aqueduct into the uh, this thing into the fourth ventricle this is how the uh, the catheter is in turn connected to a shunt actually so the cyst has been taken care of the catheter is uh, draining the cyst uh, through the aqueduct and it's connected to a normal uh, ventricular operator achavada's ventricular operator in the shunt actually so both things are care, taking care of so different areas of cysts are there the aim is as i told you where to enter and where to communicate these are two basic principles of uh, managing any arachnoid cyst uh, it's not that they will not have any uh, complications and recurrence rate it has its own set of recurrences because uh, as uh, in third ventricular ostomy if your uh, cyst opening especially in supracellular arachnoid cyst has not been adequate uh, you can uh, have a reclosure and you sometimes have to do redo of these things and the second important thing is uh, when you uh, arachnoid cyst large arachnoid cysts they collapse actually they can lead to subdural hygromas we have to be careful of those things so the surgical approach has to be tailored according to the location of the cyst and uh, endoscopic fenestration uh, can be the primary mode and uh, and it prevents any major perioperative and postoperative complications and avoid any uh, csf diversion things and uh, more and more people are doing endoscopy for arachnoid cyst as i told you after third ventriculostomy most the next most attractive uh, indication for doing endoscopy is the arachnoid cyst uh, asymptomatic cyst or a large asymptomatic cyst in a child should also undergo procedures and shunt has to be reserved for as a salvage procedures and outcome with neuroendoscopy procedures in infant is as effective as in children and a flexible endoscope if you have is a good useful adjunct in selected cases where a rigid endoscope cannot be used thank you very much thank you dr sudot as a panelist you would want to add one thing discussion very nice presentation subot especially the post processes sir very very complex and then you need to have a individual strategy and uh, subot always this project fascinates me doing all this new techniques for the post processes now i think the the, the fundamental thing is that is recognize this is a very good indication and uh, not only for the treatment even for the training you know for the beginners is one of the good uh, areas to start endoscopy so where you are reasonably safe and the the room for you to move the scope and experience the feel of the instruments is uh, much better compared to even the etv so is one of the good indications to start the surgical training as well now the one of the new uh, superdental cases what i always do is that make uh, multiple openings i mean just to make sure uh, if there is an access to the cyst and to the cistern wherever there is possible you make make try to make multiple openings so that you have uh, it's less chances of getting occlusion whereas the similar thing is not possible in post processes and the other thing is very important is the supracellulosis you need to make sure that the ventricle the cyst and the cistern are connected uh, as the ventricular cysto cistern ostomy has to be done otherwise the failure rates are pretty high so uh, this is the interesting part and uh, the other lesson we have learned is that uh, uh, all these people children require long term follow up and uh, it depends on the uh, type of the cyst and this the ben most benign ones are the sylvian cysts or uh, temporal processes whereas the supracellular and postural processes they can have uh, umpteen number of other associated problems including the the endocrine problems behavioral problems i think this have to be addressed parallelly to get the optimum results just mere uh, treating the endoscopically the cyst itself is not enough so we need to watch them for the uh, development of hydrocephalus in the long term one is that and interestingly the supracellulosis have a significant amount of uh, uh, hypothalamic as well as hypopituitarism some of them re would require an endocrine replacement so that you know their growth is done properly then they catch up 
and the post process says one of the things is that you know the apart from bobble head doll it also can have this uh, spontaneous smiling you know inappropriate smile and some another behavioral uh, uh, disorders which need to be treated and otherwise they go through a lot of uh, psychological stress in the school they think that you know, the child is abnormal and once you make sure uh, uh, this is perfectly done i think they will be fine and one of the interesting part is that when these behavioral abnormality comes back there is an indication that that there is a recurrence in the system so that's uh, probably you need to take a look at the uh, uh, redoing the procedure at the same time thank you nice presentation subod congrats uh, as usual <laughs> thank you thank you yeah, thank you excellent excellent work as usual <laughs> and uh, that uh, posterior fossa assist uh, subod i presume you did it with the flexible scope yeah flexible. because i don't see a rigid scope and if you have a bleed in that area what uh, what is your plan what is your strategy bhai jaan i hope i think you got away with it uh, have you ever had a bleed in that area never 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 uh dik dik ho the handling uh, as dr sandeep was telling blind areas is the problem because where you have bleed okay so if you are slow and going inside knowing what it is there and uh, i mean tissue respect and these things and of course if my luck is there but it's not my good day i can have a bleed but uh, luckily touch wood i didn't have any major bleed till now very important point to remember is that conventionally right from the time we join neurosurgery we always talk about aqueduct stenosis our mindset is that you always look at a narrow aqueduct and a membrane etc here is a situation where you see an aqueduct dilatation absolutely yes. therefore the nature has made that nature is really absolutely when you see that there is every possibility that you get confused so you should be very careful in what you are dealing with because you don't see it often it is a very interesting and very beautiful looking uh, structure when the aqueduct is completely dilated is like a wide corridor you you sometimes you get confused so you should be very uh, careful in identifying and then the path and it's very easy there are fourth ventricular outlet obstructions yeah. there is also a debate whether you should do only a ventricular cyst or a cystostomy or you also do a cystostomy along with that and uh, do you always do your cystostomy also along with the ventricular cystostomy for the posterior fossa cyst no no for the for the suprasellar one suprasellar sir yes double both always 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 suprasellar i do that initially few cases which i have done all so doing three. only that and then always always cystostomy always okay just to make things a little more exciting i'm going to quote venkat's paper in neurology india where venkat says that if you have arachnoid cysts success rate of endoscopy is 83% of microsurgery is 86% and then goes on to conclude in his editorial commentary that endoscopy is by far the best technique to use so with those statistics how did you get to this conclusion yeah it's uh, based on the morbidity so uh, though the results of uh, both the processes are similar if you look at last two decades uh, it was the craniotomy shunt and the endoscopy that was the preferred order to begin with then it became the shunt craniotomy and then the uh, endoscopy and now it has become the endoscopy craniotomy and the shunt so this is the how it has changed over the last two decades though if you look at if you do a very good excision of the arachnoid cyst the results are pretty good but you end up doing a large craniotomy and the morbidity associated is pretty high on the other hand the though is a 3% less with the endoscopy is a very simple procedure you can even discharge the child on the same day so with that Uh, looking at that reduction in the morbidity and more or less we are same equivalent results except uh, statistically a 3% difference i think that's how the endoscopy has become the top in the list <laughs> so i i just remembered that um, editorial comment you wrote just a few months ago so the yes. other question i was really going to ask you both i am i am no great expert in endoscopy like you guys 
But one of the problems that I am not yet come to solutions with is when you say do a big arachnoid cyst, you do a fenestration, how long does it take for that volume of that cyst to come down? And what's the time interval? Because the commonest thing that occurs is you do it, the child is fine, you send them home, a pediatrician does a CT scan and says, oh my God, it's still huge. What have they done? And whereas if you did a shunt, it would increase much faster. So I know, I, I'm not aware of a great deal of studies. I know Spiros wrote, I think, three or four cases in Charles nervous system last year when he was looking at the rate of reduction of these on post-operative imaging. So I was going to ask all you experts, what is it? Because this is a big problem because you do an endoscopic fenestration, you know you've done a good job. And then they go and some uh, uh, person will do an imaging and say, my God, it's still there. What have they done? So how, what's, the, what's the literature available on how long it takes for the volume of these cysts? When do they plateau? Because they, none of them disappear. They plateau to a certain point. I mean, few do, I agree. Perhaps the supracellar ones do. But the big middle fossa or the posterior fossas do not disappear. So what's the time interval? Because you know you need to tell the parents that very clearly before you embark on the procedure. If the, ch if the child is asymptomatic uh, after the surgery and child is doing well, I ask them not to get any scanning done before three months. So three and months... You don't, but the, the pediatricians often do. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> I tell the parents before doing it, uh, do a scan, please ask me. And the other thing is... Uh, Pre-surgery counseling also we tell them that these are developmental cysts and they don't disappear fast. There will be some amount of gap. So you may get biased by if somebody does a scan outside, as you told some pediatrician getting a scan done, I tell them beforehand only during the pre-surgical counseling. But yes, the earliest changes I have seen is uh, in some of the cysts which causes this uh, large severe pressure, even a scan after one week shows a reduction action, especially the supracellar cysts actually. A supracellar arachnoid cyst actually. And, uh, but otherwise, three months down the line, it shows significant difference. If it is not showing difference, either the cyst ventricular, the cysto, uh, the, uh, the fenestration is closed, or the uh, procedure was not required in the child. Yeah, the, the reason the why I ask actually... question on a serious note is because if you look some of, at some of the publications, they say that the volume reduces, particularly in middle fossa cysts, by about 30 to 40 percent. And it does so over a period that, if you look at literature, is quoted between three and seven months. Yeah. The problem occurs when it plateaus off. Do, how do you realize, is this a plateau or is your fenestration closed? In a child who may just have headache and uh, nothing else to show for it. This, this is a real problem that, I mean, I have faced this. I'm sure all of you have had this problem. And, and the parents come with a headache. It's reached a plateau stage. It's not reducing beyond that 30%. Now, you know that 30% reduction is very good. But uh, how do you understand? Is that the plateau stage or is it that it should be reducing further and the fenestration is not that good at that point of time? That's why it still appears this way. And if it's a very in other words, in other words, that, in is other words, there, is there any way to measure cranial pressure monitoring in these? Patients? Ah, that's what I was saying. Or do you measure the pr pressure? Even in some arachnoid cysts have got elevated pressure, while some arachnoid cysts may be large but still do not have elevated pressure. That also makes a difference in the outcome. So, no, there does are only anybody measure of, the pressure routinely? Yeah, during there the, are only a uh, couple of papers I know who measure the intracranial pressure. And they have not given any extra benefits either to prognosticate or even to decide or even to uh, uh, predict the uh, potency of the opening. In my experience, there are two issues here. One is a, a symptomatic relief, which is more or less immediate. And then persist, that is something which you can really clinically follow up. Imagine why you will see the changes after three months, changes significantly felt in six months scan. And by one year, you will see 50% reduction. Maximum is that in my experience. And beyond 50%, it, it will not go back. You will see rest of it as an indirect signs like brainstem coming back to his position, etc. The cyst cavity will remind that. Now, I have a couple of uh, uh, patients who had 15-year follow-up, and it remains at that level itself. But they are doing very well, so there is nothing to worry. 
but the moment they have any slightest symptom first thing to suspect is that uh, there is the closure of the opening yeah, i have a question for dr subodh from calcutta yeah he asked that the position of the burr hole for the posterior force assist is it anterior to the coccus point and by how much uh, for a so flexible endoscope it's a standard precoronal burr hole and if you are using a if you are using a rigid scope it has to be uh, at least 4 to 5 cm anterior to the coronal uh, uh, coronal suture because our trajectory depending on the size of the foramen membrane you have to uh, plan the trajectory actually if you are using a rigid scope for a transacuvectal procedure or posterior thoracic biopsy so do you do a ventricular systostomy as a pre op or a post op a systonogram uh i i don't have any experience with a systonogram or a ventricular system i anybody, don't do it actually anybody actually, does it? yeah we do it we do a ct ventriculogram find it useful but actually it's it's only in the post infectious case where you have multi localized hypercapnias just for that it's much more useful than the mri actually it usually tells us you know, so we shift the patient as in the old days again we get it done so the same anesthesia so it it makes it one compartment it's very easy actually it has it gives a lot more information than an mri mri is always still it's okay with a single cyst but multi septate you know multiple cell thing is very common especially after infection that we still do see it I have to say that that's exactly our we we use it for some of these multi located hydrocephalus but Venkat you will remember when Shizu used to come to perform all his uh, ETVs with that bazooka of yeah. his uh, he when he he's been to Park Clinic about four times and uh, done surgery and you know here every time every case he would insist from the operating theater they go and have a CT cystogram and then he would put in dye and want to see the dye in the cystern even for a standard ETV I have to say we have tried it a few times so she will recall and we didn't find it terribly exciting or useful for routine purposes and we never used it except maybe for these multi loculated hydrocephalus but if you look at professor roy's publications originally and as i've seen the man do it also a number of times and i'm sure you've seen him operate as well he would routinely insist that we put in dye and and found that dye on the ct scan in in the system now i'm not sure whether many people do that anymore no, i don't think anyone does that now but it would be a good uh, idea to do that if you have a doubt after the procedure whether it has blocked or not patient just comes with headache that may be because you already have a burr hole there all you have to do is to just instill some dye and see whether it goes into the system i think uh, chidambaram has a publication about using intra agitated saline with ultrasound in the upper fenestration to see the communication between the trap player system i think uh, use 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 it earlier on subsequently you know Is there anything else to be added? There was a question for Dr. Kaushik regarding if you have a basilar injury during ETB, how do you manage it? Mm -hmm. Pray to God. <laughs> Fortunately, on uh, I have not been seen a basilar injury, but uh, I think so. You don't usually you don't plunge in so as to cause a catastrophic bleeding. Small amount of bleeding usually are from the perforators rather from the Big basilar trunk itself. So, as Dr. Chatterjee pointed out, is patients, patients, and patients wash, wash, and you have to wait there with the endoscope. It is a, a, a good idea not to pull out the endoscope, but to wait at the same spot, irrigate, irrigate till the fluid clears out. And not to pull out the Fogarty catheter also. Fogarty also. catheter also, and. Once you can see a bleeding point, you can coagulate. Then you can try to coagulating it. But it's better to just allow the normal way of coagulation rather than coagulating in a perforate in a blind spot. But it's patience and time, patience and time, and probable praying to God. But I have not seen anybody encounter a basilar artery injury. Yeah, I had, I had once. I mean, one uh, variation, Kaushik. I never try to coagulate. Coagulate, you try to try to coagulate, the artery will retract. No, no. You have much more massive. Problem should never try to coagulate. I had a, a, a basilar injury. Uh, what you need to do is that first thing, don't panic. Second thing, don't remove the scope. Scope you have to be absolutely in that position. Third, 
you need to have high pressure irrigation ready meanwhile third if you have the balloon in place inflate it blind, blindly okay and by clock 20 minutes it took so if you have a temptation to check what's happening what's happening you will run into trouble 20 minutes by clock you should not deflate the uh, balloon don't move the scope keep irrigating gently make sure at that time what is written is coming is blood stained or not and enough fluid is coming back so that you don't over inflate out of anxiety and uh, tell the anesthetist to check the uh, blood pressures and uh, keep the system under control and then stay on for 25 minutes and it stopped after that uh, first thing is, is gently deflate the scope i mean the, the balloon uh, make sure that there is a clot is formed there and if the clot is formed don't try to do any further ventures and very very gently you millimeter by millimeter you take out the uh, balloon the important step is clot would have formed but when you are trying to pull out the balloon you will take out the clot as well and it will start bleeding again by then your balloon is also out so you need to be absolutely careful while irrigating gently rotate the uh, 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 Pogati catheter and take it out millimeter by millimeter and just wait for a few minutes. If there is no bleeding, you just come out and leave it. This is one place where you need to keep a ventricular access device uh, just to clear the intraventricular blood. I mean, that's I what I have done the management and make sure before you come out, the blood pressures are stable. If it is in hypotension and there is no bleeding, don't have to have, uh, you should not have that trust. So make sure that blood pressures come up and then everything is stable and come out and luckily it has stopped. It never bled after that. If you, in, a, in an adult, as is mandatory, you do an angiogram on a second day or something so that there is no pseudo aneurysm or any such thing. You will not be taken by surprise by one more bleed at a later date. So that's the, that's the procedure I think we need to follow. But usually what bleeds are the small, either the stoma margins or small perforators. Yeah, most of the time. Perforator bleeds will stop yeah. instantly. There is no problem at all. If the main trunk is the problem, it uh -huh. takes pretty long time. Pretty long time. You I, need to be absolutely discuss. patient. Just for 20 minutes minimum. Without that, don't even try to check whether it is stopped or not. But it's very, very frightening, I tell you. <laughs> it's not so easy as you no. talk about. It's absolutely yeah. frightening. You don't know what is going to be. It's like Corona situation. <laughs> Talking about Corona, I just want to know like... This post-operative fevers which occur, uh, you know, transient fevers which occur in uh, ETVs or even in uh, arachnoid cysts for that matter. In coming months, it's going to be a real headache for us. PIC is going to jump around it. So, if, you know, with COVID, no COVID and things like that. So, I, uh, so what exactly is the usual management that you do for these in uh, transient fevers post-operative have? Transient fevers don't do anything. And first, the patient will be on round the clock paracetamol and ibogesic and uh, paracetamol. In the coming months, they shoot, shoot our BPs up from the PIC. Mm, <laughs> That's sure. It's very intensive. It's not going to be. We usually, we usually tell the board, counsel, the parents, and also the um, PIC people that fever will come first one or two days after any endoscopic procedures, normal, natural. I don't think it will be a problem. Yeah, with the anesthesia, they'll cough and they'll have fever as well. Yeah. And uh, that's enough <laughs> excitement for the coming months. <laughs> is there anything I else to add? The most important thing is that uh, there is a 20% risk has been reported in uh, non COVID people undergoing an elective surgery becoming positive in the post operative period. I think that needs to be informed to the people. And if the choice is there, if there is an urgency, they can undergo the surgery. If they want to wait and uh, come back later, I think that option has to be given. It has to be documented for uh, our own safety. That's the only important. I just wanted to ask, uh, like, was there any papers about uh, CSM viral load and COVID? Because there are, I've seen general, general surgical papers about 10 times higher peritoneal load in uh, peritoneal fluid than in uh, the sun. Is there any CS thing about CSF no. fluid? Why don't Even the peritoneal fluid, only one paper is there. Yeah. Okay. There are two other papers which tell that the load in peritoneal fluid is not high. Okay. So CSF, nothing is yet. No. No. Not, not yet. Okay.
Okay, if nobody has anything else to say before uh, Santosh, you close. Yep. I just wanted to tell you that since we were debating and discussing about endoscopic third ventriculostomy today, I just wanted to wear my hat as chairman of the Education Committee of the ISPN and tell you next Friday, as you know, we the Education Committee holds a debate called Clash of the Titans, the first and third Friday of the month. Next Friday's debate is on endoscopic third ventriculostomy. And the topic is endoscopic third ventriculostomy without choroid plexus. Coagulation does not serve any purpose. And the two debaters are uh, two of um, two towering personalities of endoscopic third ventriculostomy in children on this planet. We have uh, one side of the Atlantic uh, speaking is Abhay Kulkarni, whose score you have quoted so many times. And on the other side will be Connor Maluchi. And uh, I have the good or bad fortune of chairing this uh, contest. So if you are uh, free, it's 1 p.m. Uh, GMT, which makes it 6.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time next Friday. I just thought I'd tell you because you, you, we are discussing about it. So thank you, everyone. It was an yeah. evening fruitfully used. And uh, I'm sure uh, the experience is shared by everyone, you know, the, the mistakes that they have done, the problems that they have faced will enrich our clinical practice as well. Thank you everyone for sticking to the time as well. It's not too long, so. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, when the masters speak their experience and insight, give their insights, followers come in reports. Uh, today we had uh, 455 doctors logging in for this webinar. And they have come in from 12 countries. It has been a truly international webinar, 12 countries and uh, doctors logging in from other countries are 26. So when masters speak, uh, uh, followers do listen and they get the insights so that they can go back to their operating table and uh, start practicing those insights. Uh, we would like to thank uh, Dr. Kaushik Seal for uh, conceptualizing this uh, webinar series uh, along with uh, Dr. Sandeep Chatterjee. I would also like to thank Dr. R. Murli, uh, Dr. Uh, Raju for this fantastic lecture, Dr. Kaushik Seal for his uh, lecture today, uh, Dr. K. Santosh Mohan Rao for coordinating this uh, entire session with his insightful questions, and uh, Dr. N. K. Venkatamana for his experience and insights uh, in uh, this uh, webinar. On behalf of Health and You, we would like to thank the audience for joining us today. I am sure they must have got benefited tremendously. Uh, from the insight and the experience that these experts have given. Uh, on behalf of Health and You, I would like to thank all the doctors for fighting this COVID-19 pandemic uh, for their patients and uh, request them to support Health and You products. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kaushik Seal, for allowing us to carry this webinar. It has been our pleasure and privilege to carry this expert uh, on this webinar. Uh, on behalf of Health and You, this is Deepak Naik signing off. Uh, and before that, before that, I would like to uh, tell all the audience and the speakers that this entire webinar is available on uh, DG Neuro channel of YouTube. So in case you have missed this, in case you have missed this, uh, please look at this here at a DG Neuro channel. Uh, this is it. Uh, this is available here. All our webinars, almost 25 of those webinars are available on this channel. You can go to YouTube, just search DG Neuro and you will get all the webinars. So today's webinar will be uploaded tomorrow. And in case you have missed part or you would like to look at it again, all those webinars are available. Till now, more than 25 webinars are uploaded here on neurosurgery and on neurology on various topics. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Signing thank off. You. Thank 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 you.